Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to your views on the news with me, Azhar Ali. Now, just before the break, we were uh, talking about Islam, the untold story, and we're still talking about Islam, the untold story. Um, and without any delays, because uh, the callers have been waiting for a while on the line, let's go to our phone lines. And first on the line is James from Guildford. Good evening, James. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Wa alaikum as uh, Thank you for joining us. Uh, your views? Yeah, um, really. I mean, when I watched the documentary, it was, it was quite a disappointing um, performance, really. It wasn't something you would expect a documentary maker to come out with. Mm -hmm. um, Anything in particular? Can you be specific? What, what, what did you find disappointing? Well, at university, I, I studied um, video production and, and documentary making was, you know, taught to us at a very basic level. And one of the things they taught us is that when you make a documentary, you have to be completely objective, realistically, <laughs> okay. because otherwise you don't have any credibility when it comes to the points you're trying to make. Right. And unfortunately, this documentary didn't have sources from Islamic perspectives. Right. Um, it only had sources from very selected and uh, particular, it was like a particular agenda that was looking to probably discredit Islamic historical views and his, Islamic historical uh, history. Mm. Um, I think if, if we look at a good documentary about Islam recently, it was Raghi Omar's um, The Life of the Prophet Muhammad, so that I was so saying, say, yes. where he actually got a very broad range of historians, um, even we've got Christian priests, mm. um, Jewish rabbis discussing the issues around the Prophet's life and the history about it. Mm. And it came across extremely well because it was, it was a very balanced documentary. Okay. And for a historian to produce a documentary like this, it's, it, it comes across as career suicide, really, because to, for a historian to get such facts wrong mm. and then mm. continue to have the documentary aired, it's, okay. it's well, not professional. Okay, thank you very much, James, uh, for calling in. Let's go to uh, Austin from Guildford. Good evening, Austin. Austin? Hello. Hello. Uh, good evening. You're on air. Um, your views, please. Uh, Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Now, it came across as somebody who didn't actually read history or try to uh, have an unbiased uh, opinion about our blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. First of all, the coins he presented are uh, saying that there was no image of Muhammad or something about him in the coin. That is a lot of rubbish. Hmm. I mean, he should have listened to Radi Oman when he actually made the first treaty that ever signed on this planet Earth was the Treaty of Medina between the Christians, the Jews, and the Muslims. And the documentary actually uh, showed that uh, his history was not as in-depth as that of a primary school uh, student. Okay. And uh, I'm sorry, he's just you know, signing his requiem for his books. Mm -hmm. so that's okay. So you, you think it was more just a publicity uh, stunt for his uh, book? And he's just finished his books because nobody's going to buy his books anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much for your uh, views there. Let's go to our next caller, uh, David from Manchester. Yeah, let's go to our next caller, uh, David. Good evening, David. Hello. You're on air. Uh, can we have your views? Yes, um, I'm a friend of Moore's on Twitter. Okay. Um, I've become very interested in Islam. Um, obviously, I'm a white person. I uh, used to consider myself an atheist, and mm -hmm. so I started speaking to Moore. Um, this is, it's a very difficult situation for Islam mm. at the moment, and I just wanted to ask Moore whether he thinks the programme was... Um, shed Islam in a negative light and whether he thinks this um, could people may get fueled by this can, can you just make that point again I'm not sure if we, 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 we I couldn't hear you clearly or did you understand what the I, point? Think, I think I caught that okay all right then that's great okay thank you David for your uh, call Let, and can I say hello to David firstly one of my um, one of my loyal Twitter followers is okay uh, brilliant well you have said hello to David no I haven't um, now um, well let's can I take that one first, first yeah. I think you know Dave's asking a really important question which is does it does it show islam in a bad light and i think it doesn't lay a finger on islam but what it does do is it it, it stabs muslims in the back mm. and it hurts us at a time of unparalleled islamophobia and anti-islam rhetoric and the rise of the far right we have the government refusing to ban the english defense league mm. we have an islamophobia network which 
people like Nick Knowles at Hope Not Hate will, will talk very uh, credibly about. And we've got these very clear links and the rise of an anti-Islam message across Europe. Is this the right time to be producing a program mm. which doesn't even reflect the academic balance of his book, mm. which you can be critical about? Yeah. And what's the effect of this at a time in, in this pressure cooker? In, in this environment, and many Muslims would have been so horrified. Was, uh, so you, do you think it's irresponsible of Channel 4 for airing it or for commissioning it? I think certainly it's been reckless. Okay. And reckless is recognising there's a risk and going ahead and taking it. That's my legal hat on. Okay. Right? And Tom and Channel 4 both would... I don't think Channel 4 will will apologise. I think they may well look into it and they'll acknowledge it, but it's it's uh, all publicity is good publicity well, for them. But the first two callers, I mean, they mentioned about yeah. the inaccuracies. For you, I mean, you, you've seen well, I th it. I think uh, the what, what are the inaccuracies? Well, the first caller was, was very, um, and I think it was, um, uh, the first, James was the first caller from Guildford, and he made a comment. He said he thought it was professional suicide. And, mm. I, and I hate to say, I think there is a risk that could be the case. Mm. If you are a very credible scholar, and suddenly you produce a work which is seen to be pandering to the right, which fuels um, the thought leaders of the far right and the Islamophobes of the world. Interestingly enough, most people won't realise that Tom's book hmm. was pre-released in Holland, in Dutch, and it was entitled The Fourth Beast. Really? Yeah. Wow. Now, why would he publish that in Geert Wilder's backyard called, or the, why would the publishers do that? Hmm. And call it the fourth beast. Well, they must have now. Tom, Tom, Tom will say, "Well, it's the fourth beast in terms of the the fourth of these great empires." But you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. But clearly, if you are writing a book saying Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, possibly didn't exist, or that Islam was invented, mm -hmm. or that, um, uh, that it, the Quran wasn't even revealed in Mecca; it was revealed in Transjordania hundreds of years later. Yeah, yeah. There are major issues about where is this going and why is it going in this direction. I think historians, scholars, academics, people like um, Bowersock, people like even but non-historians like Sadat have been very clear about sure, historical but specifically in the documentary itself, yeah. what 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 stands out as inaccurate? Well, I, I've, you know, I've I, I've had lots of and, and the Twitter discussions are there for everybody to have a look at between myself and Tom. We have private discussions and emails as well, mm. but what's public people can see. And one of the questions I asked him was when you. Um, turned to one of your very few Muslim academics, which was a Bedouin in the desert, mm. who clearly wasn't a scholar and wasn't an academic, yeah. but somehow he was being shown as an Islamic credible yeah, source. Yeah. He asked him to recount a story of, uh, or, or there was a story being recounted of mm. uh, Umar ibn Khattab and about how Islam came and stopped things like female infanticide. That's right. Yeah. And the story that the Bedouin tells is how the sand blew into Umbra's beard and he and he and he brushed it away as before he scooped a, a hole and buried his child. Mm. Now on the subtitles, you will notice if you recorded it or look back on on, on these online things and, and have a look at it, it doesn't say Umr ibn Khattab, it says a follower. Mm. Now when I asked Tom, I said that's a very subtle thing. It wouldn't have been very difficult to put that in there. Yeah. Why didn't you put that in? He claims creative license. Creative license well, to, that, to that change can, someone's name to a follower. Well, that that it would have taken too long to explain who he is, and and I. Why why would you need to? I mean, the Bedouin is saying the name. Yeah, I, I think when it comes to subtitles, because it, of course the if we look at the consequence of it rather than the attention, the consequence of course that people who watch this documentary who have a huge ignorance of Islam. Mm. Now just think, when you went to school or I went to school or others went to school in this country. You're not taught about Islam. No, no. Islamic contribution, you're not taught about Ibn Haytham. You're not mm. taught about Al-Ghazali. You're taught mm. about Newton. And you're taught about um, modern European Western classicism yeah. and Western science. But you're not taught about the Islamic contribution. Okay. And of course, what this does is it clouds the territory. Right. And it makes Just the hold your thoughts there. Um, I want to bring Hassan in. Um, uh, he's waiting on the line. Salaam alaikum, Hassan. Hassan, salaam alaikum. Uh, you're on air, your views. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. You're on air, your views. Yeah, I watched the program as well. Uh -huh. It's uh, a complete distortion. Okay, what, what yeah. was the distortion? Yeah, what Islam has to do for him to go to the, to the tube to talk about Islam. Okay. You know, what I'm planning to do, what can we do to, 
you know, to, uh, because I wanted to contact my MP. Right. So mm. what can we do to challenge this? Mm. Okay, that's a very good question, Great Hassan. Question. And, and we will, and I'm going to ask Muhammad that question, uh, inshallah. But let's take our next caller. Um, hello, as alaikum. Yeah. Wa alaikum salam rahmatullah. Um who's that? You sound familiar. This is Nabila. Oh mashallah Nabila. How are you? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Okay, thank you for joining us. Now um uh without using any expletives, uh, what did you make uh, of the program? Well, um I thought that the um actually the, the presenter was quite um I felt like he was a bit lost. I don't know if anyone else sort of um tapped in on that. Mm. It was, um he felt I felt like um he was kind of just clutching at straws really. Mm. Um and uh, and just coming up sort of whipping up any old sort of nonsense. It was like let's just come up with a hypothesis. He was just being creative. And that's what it felt like to me. Mm. Um and he wasn't really coming up with anything you know, self proof or evidence, if it even come up with some archaeological evidence or anything which was even academic in any way, mm. people might have listened. Because so I think it's quite interesting to get, you know, new perspectives on Islam or whatever from, from a historian's point of view. But he just sounded like any old bloke down the street. And, and what I captured from him was it was just wandering around, kind of very lost. And he was just trying to find his way in something which was just way beyond anything that he could capture. Mm. And do, do you think, I mean, the, the central premise that he had was that um, there's no reference uh, to or about Islam or the Prophet, peace be upon him, um, before any of the conquests. So basically, 100 years after the death of the Prophet, there, there is actually nothing. Did he, do you think that documentary made that point? I don't think it did, really, um, and I think because they, they, they didn't really take into account how Islam was, it was sort of spread and even, you know, the, the foundations of Islam being through oral history, mm. um, he only touched upon that very, very lightly, and he didn't really go into the importance of that, and even, you know, I'm sure linguists that watch the program, you know, to, to do, you know, have, who have studied Arabic, We'll be able to to talk about the you know the the the, the origins of the Quran just from a linguistic point of view uh, as to the origins and, and the type of Arabic that it that it that it has. So mm. um, you know I'm not a scholar. I'm just a person that watches TV and was interested to find it. And I thought you know let me watch this. And I found myself wanting to throw things at the telly. And, <laughs> and okay. at the end, I actually felt quite sorry for him because he just looked really because he was even he he didn't even speak to anyone who um, who was giving him a Quran in Arabic. He just picked up any old copy of the Quran and was just pricking through the pages and just mm. find it like it was just really bizarre. I just thought this is man's supposed to be an academic. Yeah. Okay, Nabila. Uh, thank you very much for your call. Um, uh, Jazakallah khair. Alaikum as salam. Um, I mean, look, that's how many people felt. It just, yeah, you know, know, it was know, all yeah. over the place. <clears throat> I think that one, one of the things we have to look at is that the big argument from the Muslim community is why didn't you turn to any credible Islamic scholars? And mm. Sayyid Nasr is a, is a respected scholar, but admittedly he's not a historian, mm. he's a philosopher. Yeah. And the Nasr uh, Foundation look at certain areas, but Islamic history, if you like, yeah. specifically Islamic history isn't one of them. I mean, mm. he could have turned to any of them. And any, any modern contemporary alims who could have, I'm sure, contacted the Tim Winters or Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad or Hamza yeah. Yusuf, say, he could have gone to any range of relatively accessible people and asked them, are you happy to give me, uh, are you happy to give, you know, your, mm. your view and things? I think the... Uh, but for, 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 what, what other point um, a lot yeah. of people mentioned, two people have definitely mentioned, is about the oral tradition. I mean, why was he so dismissive about that? Well, I've asked him about this specific issue. I mean, I, I was in a, in, a, in a big marquee. There were 500 people sat listening to Tom's talk. Uh, this was back in, in May, I think, and uh, on, on his book. And it was very respectful Islam. Now, maybe he was aware that I was sat at the back of the room <laughs> and he wasn't trying to offend me. And I did threaten to heckle him. I didn't, obviously. Um, but it was a joke amongst friends. I said, look, I'm going to heckle you if you say something wrong. And so he was very nice. He treaded, treaded quite politely through mm. what is a bit of a minefield. He could easily put his foot wrong. Maybe he knew he had the documentary up his sleeve and he didn't have to say anything mm. bad or controversial. However, I stood up at the end and I asked a question. I said, well, why have you ignored the Hadith? Mm. Why have you dismissed the Sunnah? Yeah. of the Prophet Now, interestingly, he says, well, I don't accept the oral tradition of the Muslims. Mm. And when we talk to him about the ilm ul hadith, you know, when we talk to him about the, uh, the hadith um, uh, 
science, I suppose is the best way of calling it, the Hadith science, authenticated witness statement is what the Hadith yeah. are made up of. I, I take slight uh, issue I mean, the, the with argument. Dr. Assad. I take slight issue with Dr. Assad, yeah. who called them stories. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's okay. Sure. But, but sure. I, not, I think he's just meant it. But yeah. if I can just interrupt, because uh, well, we've got loads of callers and I will no, go to them, is the point Patricia Crone makes yeah. is oral traditions, you can choose what you remember. Mm -hmm almost giving the impression that things that are written down cannot be changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what, why is something that's written down valued higher than, than something that is passed down um, in an oral tradition? The, the odd thing is when you study theology, when you study the history of religions, authenticated uh, witness statements, hadith, which, you know, the systems of law and hearsay we have today are founded on the principles of the hadith science. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you have to bear that in mind. So that is the heart, what, one of the accepted forms of historical evidences yeah. in this field. Yeah. And so there are, there are some criticisms saying not only did you ignore this stuff, but it's absurd that you ignored this stuff mm. because there are Western scholars, there are Western scholars like uh, Warnsborough, Ripon, there are French scholars, Gibbon, um, there's um, De Roche and Robin as well. And all of these scholars have said there is a mass of evidence. Mm. Now, okay, let's okay. Uh, hold it there because um, I do want to go through my callers because they've been waiting for a while. So let's go to our phone lines. Let's see who's there. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Asalaamu Alaikum. Asalaamu Alaikum. Anyone there? Okay, sorry, who's calling? Am I on air? So you are on air, sister? Oh yes, it's sister Asma. I think we've got three lines crossed here. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, the, um, the program in itself had no substance. So, oh, you know, it um, was a terrible program. It wasn't even made properly. Mm. Um, I'm not a scholar and I'm not a historian, um, but Holland speaks as, as though he was a racist because the program seems to discredit the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, okay. and no mention of the message mm. that the Prophet actually brought. So there was nothing to really learn from what he was actually saying. Mm. And um, he should remember that the number one person voted by a non-Muslim was the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who mm. was most intelligent. So <clears throat> I think when they need to make programs like these, they need to actually speak to people who know something about the subject and he looked a right fool on TV because to me it wasn't even worth listening to. Mm. Okay. okay, thank you uh, Sister Asma for your views there. Let's go to our next caller, let's see who's online. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Uh, you're on air, what's your name brother? Ahmed. Ahmed, okay. Uh, your views please. Right, yeah, the, the, I want to get your opinion actually, whether you agree with me on this. The Tom Holland program, I got the impression that Tom Holland, uh, like many other non-Muslims, um, is a little bit envious when he hears about the wonderful place that Mecca is and the wonderful experiences that people have there. Because he's a non-Muslim, he can't get entry into Mecca, mm. right, okay? And um, maybe he's the one that's lost and is looking for something. If you look at the, at the program very carefully and you look at how he reacted when he was in Jerusalem, mm. the Luxor, yeah. He, um, I got the impression that he was a bit overawed by his surroundings. Mm. He was actually quite overcome okay. by where he was. And then there was, of course, the scene where uh, he was praying with the Bedouins. Okay, thank uh, you, Ahmed. Um, I praying. have to cut you short because we're, we've come nearly to the end of the show. Just very briefly, what should people do? I think, firstly, people need to react in a positive way. I think we've moved on from uh, and learnt as a community and as communities from the cartoon situation. I think we've learned from the satanic verses. I think we should be more proactive, more, more positively engaged. If you're concerned, you can write to Ofcom, you can write to Channel 4, you can set up e-petitions, speak to your MPs. And actually, why not educate yourself and mm. the people around you as to where he's made the mistake? Why not use this challenge and turn it around and make it something positive? Yeah. Right? And I think, I think we have to be very careful around the language we use, the Prophet said he hadn't come but to perfect our manners. So I think we have to be more measured in our approach. I think calling people racists or Islamophobes doesn't help. But let's enter into an academic discourse. Okay. And I think that's the way forward. Okay. Jazakallah khair, Muhammad Ansar, for coming in. And an apologies, uh, I couldn't give you more time. No, and uh, apologies to my callers, I couldn't take all your calls. It would seem that Islam, the untold story, is still untold. 
see you next week. Assalamu alaikum.